Uh, okay, look, well, thanks for... <laughs> okay, I can take a hint. Um, thanks for coming along. Look, this is, uh, this is a kind of pricey of a lecture that I was uh, fortunately invited to give in KL last year <coughs> when a uh, couple of recent grads from the school invited me to come over and talk about architecture. Uh, I gave them some topics to list and they chose this one and another one out of the half a dozen. And when the real guys asked me if I was interested to do one, I thought, well, I'll do this one again. <coughs> um, not, certainly not because it features any work from the office, but because it is interested in, I think, thoughts about the nature of architecture at the moment, and particularly as displayed in critique. Um, and I think we crossed, for, from the feedback I got, it covered some pretty interesting points, and I'm, of course, interested to share them with you. The first thing I have to say is that, for me, critique is positive. Um, I was kind of warned about that in Malaysia because critique is, they don't talk about <coughs> critique, particularly in Asia, but certainly in Malaysia, because you don't, you don't go negative on anybody. You know, face saving, all of that stuff is quite paramount. So, <coughs> but they still wanted me to talk about it. So I thought about it and I am a kind of glass half full kind of person, so and I think architecture is inherently positive. It is not possible for architecture to be negative. So given that, um, I thought about the nature of critique, and I did suggest to myself that at one point, the thing that joins all of us together as architects is architecture. And you know this amazing thing called architecture that we all are party to, uh, is something that we all share. And any critique should be about the stuff that we want to get out of it. I would also suggest that, <coughs> like all of us as architects, we need to have some empathy, which is commensurate with your colleagues who make the buildings. It's easy to can someone else's work, but I think it's disingenuous to yourself if you don't consider that, in fact, when someone does a piece of work, particularly a piece of work that gets published, even in a sort of lame archy porn magazine, someone in those offices thought it was probably a good idea, probably better than a good idea, probably thought it was one of the best ideas they've had for a time. And to treat it as though it wasn't is a little bit silly, if not kind of, <coughs> well, certainly not very humanist, and it's certainly not very accepting of the fact that all of us will try pretty hard to do good work, hoping that someone will enjoy with at least, not wanting to sound like a hippie, the goodness of what you tried to put forward. So <coughs> my suggestion about critique was to try and see that critique should be argued in that way. <coughs> there are other dilemmas we face now, which is because personalization is so to the fore and individuation is so to the fore, <coughs> it's very difficult for us, well not very, but it is difficult for us to see the public nature of architecture as an event. That really, for me, all architecture is public. I've done, you know, this was our own house in Perth. We spent a lot of time building it, a lot of time doing it. We knew as soon as it was done, it was completely public. The fact that we lived in it is completely irrelevant to its contribution to architecture because even the neighbours have to look at it, they don't have a choice. And anybody who visits it, they don't visit Desmond Rosanna's head, they visit this house. So we realise that there must be something, it must say things that other people must enjoy with, even though it was our house, and it wasn't our house for that long. <coughs> so now it's moved on to someone else, and we hope that their head has some connections to what goes on here. I've been lucky enough to visit works as profound as Leverance's you know, incredible, it's not my computer so I can't make it bigger, um, <coughs> incredible chapel at Klippan and got a sense of the contribution that, ma I call this a masterwork for sure, the contribution that masterworks make into this dimension of architecture. So, you know, we try pretty hard, you visit these works, you think about the nature of the critique for them. The one thing that also comes out of this is you realise that the masterworks often engage great critique because they ask the critics to come up to that level. 
So I was starting to think, because I'd been asked to write a couple of articles about whether when you write about lesser work, should you necessarily write about it lesser, or should you try and deal with some of the issues that it's trying to deal with, and if you can see the possibilities through that channel to talk about bigger issues, then you should do that. <coughs> uh, I can make it slightly smaller, okay. <coughs> so I would suggest that, that critique is adding into architecture. You should add something in. Even if you think the work is flawed, you should try, I, for me, you try to enunciate the flaw and see what you can add in via that vehicle. So rather than finding a hole in someone's armour and then sticking the gun in it, <laughs> is to find the hole in the armour, try to argue why they didn't realise there was a hole in the first place and what might be done to either plug it or not do it next time. Or, in fact, add in to what you thought they were trying to do so that it might have the dimension that they figured that they were going to <coughs> realise with the building. I then, wrote, I then I wrote architecture as a discipline and critique. For me, architecture is a discipline. And there are lots of architects, but some in particular, who I think have addressed the idea of architecture as a public event and also as a discipline quite fully. <coughs> some of you may know that this is a little one of Louis Kahn's favourite or famous little drawings with his aphorisms about architecture. Uh, I have a lot of time for Kahn for a whole lots of reasons, but I admire his struggle with trying to define architecture. I think he was certainly one of those people who saw architecture as inherently positive and he tried to describe to other architects, particularly to other architects, what he was trying to do as an architect because he saw all of us as doing the same thing as him. So he's a very additive character. So he tried to come up with little descriptions like architecture comes from the making of a room. <coughs> uh, People don't say the same thing in a large room that they do in a little room. All these beautiful little ideas that Kant puts forward, which are positive contributions to architecture. I can take those things to someone else's work and talk about the big idea of Kant relative to someone else's work. So this is me trying to add in. This is him doing it as a discipline, not a personal thing. Even though this is a very personal statement, he's, con he's making a public contribution. He wants us to understand it. He already understands it. He's sending it out to us to see if we can add it in to our repertoire and our way of thinking. <coughs> so I wrote architecture as a discipline and critique. I wrote, and these two go together, whereas my work or our work and critique is much more difficult. Right. So you've heard lots of people talk about my work. You hear lots of you see lots of people on their website now, they all look like superstars, they've never made a mistake, everything is completely perfect, <coughs> it's also very personal. So the idea of a kind of objectivity that you need to bring to critique is very difficult in that circumstance. If you see architecture as a discipline and that you're adding something to, as Ian McDougall used to call it, the big club, then your contribution is to something bigger than anything, if not everything you do. So you're trying to add into it. If you see it as your work, or our work, or my work, then it's very difficult to see yourself adding into it. It's also very, very difficult for others to critique it without it seeming like they're having a personal go at you, or that they have to personalise their critique to find a way into it. So at this point, even the critique becomes personalised, rather than public, if you like, or at least collective. <coughs> if I lean on Hannah Arendt with this sort of sense of objectivity and comparative discussion, she would suggest to you that you need your individuation for your logic and your reason, but you need a community of others for judgment. And, uh, and critique is judgment, I would suggest. The development of the work, right, is... In a sense, the, you know, there's a whole lot of logic in the office, there's a whole lot of clarity that people are trying to undertake as a group of individuals in the office, but when the work goes out there, the judgments they make then become collective. So I try, through critique, to see the collective identity that's being attempted and try to get at it through that. I should say at this point that, <coughs> for me now anyway, um, you know, because I've been hanging around architecture for a long time, I've now started to understand that to do good critique, 
you need to un you need to get some inference from people who know how to think. Uh, it's easy, it's relatively easy for me and certainly all of us to make architectural judgments, particularly compositional judgments. Oh, I wouldn't do that. That would be better. Why did they choose that colour? Blah 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 blah. But if you want to make judgments larger than your personal view, me, you get great training in that by attempting to find out from people who spend most of their time thinking. And for me lately, as some of you all know, Hannah Arendt is high on that list. Charles Taylor, another philosopher who I think has an incredible amount to offer, particularly into this conversation. John Ralston Saul, and to some degree, also lately, um, the brilliant novelist Marilyn Robinson. All of those people are trying to make contributions to the way we currently think, and I think they offer them to people in other fields to help us think more clearly. So I have started to do this with critique, to try and understand how good thinkers think, and then because I'm an architect, bring that to architecture. <coughs> I've written here, with regard to the, because I was asked about critiquing, particularly before I gave the lecture, is Artie who invited me over, asked me about the personalization of critique. And I had written about this, these thoughts about a relative kind of objectivity or the fact that you have to not depersonalize, because I write, if I write an article, I write it anyway. The authorship of it, yes, it's Dear Smith wrote the article, but that's not really of import. What's really of import is whether the person who authored it has something to say that others may share. I think what we currently confront quite fully is that because individuation is so prominent nowadays, each of you, you've got, what's when I made the comment before about people's websites, everybody has to look like a superhero, uh, you've never made a mistake, every building you've done is perfect, everything's full of money shots, that kind of pumping up puts a personal stamp on things. And this individuation is very, is very rampant. All of us have individually kind of developed ourselves. This is Charles Taylor talking about this. And the problem with that is that when we have a whole lot of individuated personalities, it's very difficult to argue positively or con constructively with someone else because they often feel like you're trying to change them rather than talk about the work itself as a thing that we both might be able to make a contribution to. Because we are so personally in, in constructed and individuated these days, getting over that is probably the hardest bit. <coughs> okay. I'm, as usual, I kind of lose my space, so I'm going to, I'll read out a couple of things. Also to get this to happen, which is the discipline and critique, in any kind of fecund, positive, propositional manner, then we have to have something collective stroke public to deal with. We have to have something that is concerned with all of us equally. And I think that's the bit that's often missing with architecture for us these days, the fact that the work is offered to everybody equally. If it comes heavily authored and heavily owned, it's not seen as something that you're offering out to others, come what may, because you you're seen as putting yourself forward. You must have all had conversations with your colleagues or arch architects that you're working with, and they will continuously talk about our work. Sometimes I'll often talk about my work. And it's very difficult to then see that, no, this is a public contribution. You're very lucky to be an architect, to be in a position to make buildings, which hopefully make sense of people's lives for them. That's how I see it. My life makes reasonable sense to me anyway. I don't need buildings, because I'm an architect, I don't need buildings to explain myself. But I do buildings because I think they clarify at least spatial occupation and position for those who aren't trained in it. So that's how I see the contribution. So when I make the critiques of people, I'm trying to understand that there is something that we all share, which is the work, no matter who authored it. The authorship thing is the first bit you have to go about it. And further this, to this collective public thing, I mean the work must acknowledge that it has an inescapable place in the world, that the work is in the world, period. That you can't remove that. So what you want to do is you have to enjoin with the fact that it's in the world for everybody to be in party with, if you like. <coughs> 
and it must have something to say about the very nature of building and creating environments for all of those who use them. <coughs> and then I wrote again, you know, try and do a cross-reference to Arendt, Hannah Arendt with reason and judgment. And for me, these speak of the correct things that I need my reason as an architect to understand what I'm trying to do, but really the test of it is when it goes out into the public domain, which I argue all architects does, we all bring judgment to it, and I have to understand the judgment of the public domain to see whether I'm getting close to making any contribution. Particularly because for me, I don't need to do the work for me. Right? I just consider myself lucky enough to have been an architect and worked on some good work and currently also working on some. <clears throat> and of course, someone like Louis Kahn is exactly that kind of character. Yes, he's highly personal. But that's of interest to me as an architect because I'm also an architect. But the work is not really Louis Kahn built in concrete. That's not the point. The point is that Kahn is trying to understand his head, because that's the only thing he can do, relative to all of us. And he tries to make work that we all have a place in. And if you've ever visited a great work, and I hope some of you have had this feeling, that you visit great work, and I said this today to the ones, uh, you visit great work and it seems like it knew you were coming. <laughs> it seems like it knew you were going to show up because it seems to know about the way you think about things, even if you disagree with it. Which, even as a, <laughs> as a relatively intelligent person, I know that happens incredibly rarely. But when it does happen, it's fabulously special, even if I disagree with it. Because I get a sense that whoever put it together, even if I've never spoken to them, it seems as though they understand me. So this public scale of the contribution is incredibly important. It's actually what all, I would argue all of the masters, all of the great architects, spend all of their time thinking about. They don't need to worry about themselves. They spend all of their time trying to understand the correlation between the way they think and others think. Because they can't help but do work out of their head, but it's not their head that's important. It's applying to your head and your head and your head, at least with something to say, even if you disagree, which is the most important bit. <coughs> okay. And I wrote, architecture and critique. You need the architecture before you can have the critique. <laughs> which also means that the work you want to critique has to have some architectural quality about it. It has to attempt to engage with some kind of architectural endeavour. And I try to read that in the work. I watched a fascinating um, thing that uh, Diego mentioned recently about, um, it was called Tim's Vermeer, about a guy looking at Vermeer's work <coughs> and realised that one of the fantastic things about this guy's study of Vermeer was if you want to understand Vermeer, you can just look at the work. <laughs> Right? And if I'm correct, Diego, the guy nailed it by just looking at the work, particularly helped by David Hockney, who has also said lots of times, why do the art historians think they have to find some kind of transaction note from the paint supplier to work out what Vermeer might have been painting and why did he choose that colour? He just says, just look at the painting and try and understand what he's trying to say. What is in the painting? What's being said in the painting? I know of a and I love anecdotes, I had this br brilliant anecdote from Ernest Hemingway, who was once asked in an interview about his novels, what's the message in your novel? And Hemingway said to the interviewer, if I want to send a message, buddy, I go down the post office. <laughs> the message is the novel. Read the novel and you decide what it's about. Don't ask me. That's why I wrote the novel. That is my method of talking about the things that I think are worth talking about. Right? Don't ask me. That's why I'm a novelist. That's also why you're an interviewer. You should pay more attention to the kind of things that you're interviewing with regard to. And the Vermeer uh, do, um, doco was exactly that, I thought, because the person who did it was completely unskilled as a painter. And he just looked at what was being painted to try and not only understand Vermeer's technique, but through the technique try to understand what the hell was Vermeer thinking? How did he get to this point? And I found it incredibly instructive. <coughs> okay. 
it also means if you're going to have architecture before you have critique, you need some kind of definition of architecture. And I think, I think that's important. <laughs> so for me, it has certain qualities like it's a public commitment, it has a public con position, and it's a commentary about being in the world. That's what, that's what it is. So even if I think the work is not great, for me, I try, to, I try to bring that to it to try and see what it's contributing. Okay? Probably despite what the authors, certainly more recently, might say. <coughs> I also, because of that, I've written here, I see architecture as a public thing. It's not a personal thing. And that's why I call it a discipline, not an art, not a science. Yeah, the part it's a business, but that's actually the business of architecture, not architecture. <coughs> So I've written here, but as an architect, I can, stroke, must relate to the personnel or the personality of the architects involved because I want to know about Mies van der Rohe because I'm also an architect. But that's, a, that's at an architect to architect inference. He can give me lessons about how to think like an architect. But if I look at the work and critique the work, I have to try and understand what the work's contribution out to the public actually is. <coughs> Okay, so with that, I've said here, we must have something to say, that's architects, we must have something to say, because it's inescapable. Even if you say, I have nothing to say, I say that's both inescapable and in fact, completely unacceptable, because <coughs> you can't make it through the day if you have nothing to say. You can't get out of bed. Why would you get out of bed? You are going to say something, try to understand what you're going to say. <coughs> I was going to broach into lack of meaning in current practice. I've often called, I have noted that certainly my suggestion that the playful, confidence and safe style professionalism of current work is really the escape valve for meaning. Because many architects, because they don't push themselves into the publicness of it, they don't think the work means things. They talk about them as though the things we did. So they're fully descriptive, rather than I don't need descriptions of the work. I want to know what the work is trying to say. If I can't see anything larger than the work in it, then the work is flawed. If I talk to the architects and don't get anything back from them other than we did this, we chose these colours, then I'm a bit lost in terms of what its public contribution will be. <coughs> Oops, I'll go back to that one. and. I'm going to make this slightly bigger. <coughs> and my point here is that I think, well, there's a couple of things here, but certainly the two up front are that the, the great works make the best critics do their best work. And with that, when they confront really powerful architectural works, they also indicate and realise that they have to chew off a piece of it that they can get their head around, offer their best, best explication of it, and then in the end, refer to the fact that, and I've only chewed on that bit. The work is much, much bigger than the things I've covered. But I've tried to cover this bit well. Okay? Also, with that, because we don't get good critique often, and so much comes at us now, we don't read very well. So people don't read clearly particularly when people write fulsomely, and you've all been guilty of this, as have I, but I've slowed, well, I don't know if I've slowed up a bit, but I certainly read more accurately than I used to. If you slow up, if you get a good piece, you need to make sure you digest it. So this little passage, the bit that I've bracketed, comes at the end of, in Frampton's great book, Studies in Tectonic Culture. There's a section on Mies. And in one paragraph for me, he does this brilliant summation of a fair cohort of what Mies did. Right? So I'm just going to read it. Okay. By accepting the triumph of universal technology and by concentrating as a result on the how of technique rather than the what of institutional form, even that is full on in terms of just way you, the ways you may address architecture accepting the triumph of universal technology. So he's already saying, Mises is saying that technology is going to get you anyway. It's going to win. So you might as well treat it positively. 
by accepting the triumph of universal technology. And thus, because of that, concentrating on the result as a result on the how of technique. So how do we do things? Because things are going to be done anyway. And technology has a kind of depersonalization process anyway. That's why it's called technology and not craft. Okay? So result on the how of technique rather than the what of institutional form. And of course, Louis Kahn is the what of institutional form. Because Louis Kahn said architecture really addresses the great institutions of man. Okay? Mises is going, I don't disagree with, this is really important. Mises is saying, I don't disagree with you, Louis Kahn. Just that I don't see the world as clearly through that vein as you do. I see it as technology and universal measure first, within which the institutions can take place. Louis Kahn, standing on Mises' shoulders, says, I get all that, and now we can put the institutions back into it. And if you're an architect operating at the time, particularly when Kahn comes along, that's exactly what happens. Because prior to that, Mises' technology seemed to be winning. And Mises had never said the institutions don't count. It was all the lesser people who said that. And that's why this bit of writing by Frampton is so good. <clears throat> Mises strove to liberate the subject from the pathos of its insignificance when set against the flood tide of modernisation. This is fucking brilliant. Me strove to liberate the subject, which means you. <laughs> You're gonna, it's gonna, technology and the, the mass universalisation of the world is gonna get you. But that's unacceptable because humans need to be human. And me, through buildings, if you pay attention and if you're lucky enough to share bits of the space with them, you'll get it. When Mies puts a steel beam up in front of you, he's saying this is important and it's important for you because this is the world you live in. And if you want to know how precise, how clear, how uninterrupted the space that my liberate is, please visit. Yeah? And that's what he's trying to say. The, 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 liberate the subject from the pathos of its insignificance. Because he knows that it's going to get you. And that's a pathos. And you can't afford to be insignificant. Okay? The flood tide of modernization. It's not just some passing fad. It's fucking enormous. And it's all over the world. Mises is going, it's big. He calls, he calls it the whole epoch. Right? So he's saying, this is the context we work in. So we need to understand it. This brings me to another thing about the internal critique of both what Frampton's doing and what Mies is allowing Frampton to see. Because you see what's going on here, don't you? This is not Frampton's view of the world. This is his world being opened up by looking at Mies. By realising, God, this guy is all over it. He sees my world clearer than I do. Right? And I can go, yeah, that, Kenneth, you're pretty clever, but he's Mies. And he has to build things that we struggle to talk about. That's, that's really what he's saying here. Like others of his generation, blah, 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 Mies recognised modern technology as a dichotomous destiny that was at once both destroyer and provider. Lots of critics have just said the modern world is just going to overrun. Mies would say, you c it's inadmissible. You can't allow that to happen. The modern world is for us. It's for humans. So if it is going to be the destroyer, it also has to be the provider. Because <laughs> the destroyer can't win. It's just unacceptable. <laughs> so he sets about trying to show you how the technology, the flood tide of modernization, is in fact your provider. Because at the very least, you don't have an alternative. Which is pretty powerful. And if you're lucky enough like me to have visited a couple of the good Mies buildings, you realise that because <clears throat> I've been to the Park Avenue Seagram building. There's other very fine buildings, and across the road is Leader House, Gordon Bunshaft, a very, very fine, delicate building. The Seagram building is unsurpassable in its elegance. The, the sheer elegance of it is incredible. <clears throat> and if you need any further proof of exactly what Frampton's saying here, the fact that the Seagram Plaza, which if you look at it as an urban designer, is the most brutal plaza in New York. Couple of ponds, dead flat, slight undulation in the paving, so he gets a few steps in. 
trees right up to the edge of the planting. It's the most popular lunchtime spot in Park Avenue. Okay, and it's also the toughest because everybody who goes there realizes this is a real place. Whoever put this together knows how I feel and what I always look at every day should be this good. My mum visited, if she did, she'd never recognize the fact that the I-beams on the wall are bronze. <laughs> but Mies knows if I do them out of bronze, the thousand year gig is all mine. And they'll look like that perfectly, elegantly for a thousand years. So people who lunch there can back that because it comes unchanging. Daniel Gibbs said today, it appears timeless when you're there because it's not affected by time. Right? So these larger qualities is what he's talking about here. <clears throat> he saw it as the apocalyptic demiurge of the new era and the inescapable matrix of the modern world. It was this that prompted him to shift the focus of architecture towards technique and away from type and space form. And in writing that, Frampton knows that type and space form is Le Corbusier. Okay? Frampton also knows that both of them are geniuses. What it also tells you is that both of them have a different coverage of being in the world, both of which are fully available, but probably not available together through the one person. Because right? Mies is a genius and Corb is a genius. And they both understand the world via, this is where the personalization comes in, via their personality. But they're not trying to convince me that I should be Corb. Corb is not trying to convince me that I should be a little Corbusier. He's just going, the world is possible to see dichotomously. I will clarify that for you. But I will not exclude Mises' universalism. I just can't do everything at the same time. <clears throat> and I th suggest Mises is doing the same thing. The critique here of... Frampton is doing exactly that. He's trying to say, there's a big picture being painted here and I have to talk about it at that scale. And yes, he references Mies because Mies is, Mies is the author. But that's of interest to us. That's not the real point. The real point is what is the work doing? Okay. <coughs> Always assuming that the latter, type and space form, would be spontane spontaneously fulfilled either through the limitless freedom of the open plan or through the changing subdivision of cellular space. He's not always correct though, because we know that the changing subdivision of cellular space, if it's not done really well, it's just plain fucking boring. Like it's just boring. And that's a problem. That's a problem. The big me spaces are great. And Detlef Mertens, another great critic, has written about this quality of me. <coughs> Within these parameters, the art of building for me meant the embodiment of the spirit in the banal of the real. The spiritualization of technique through tectonic form. I'm looking at Diego going, oh, to do a building that was good enough for someone to describe it like that. <laughs> then you'd think, we did something. We really got somewhere at this point. Yeah. That's pretty cool. The spiritualization of technique through tectonic form. Okay. <coughs> So what's Des trying to say there? He's trying to say that good critique has to be read very carefully and if it's coming at you thick and fast, just slow down. Slow down and make sure you get every word that you think is delivered at you so you understand. Otherwise you'll read it and go, yeah, yeah, got that, got that, Kenneth. It's great, lovely, really happy for you. Move on. What's next? Yeah, And you miss how important that is. Also how rare that is, particularly now for someone to both write like that and certainly against or with work like that. And we know that the work is phenomenal. We also know that it's flawed, but the phenomena is much greater than the flaws. <coughs> and there it is, the fabulous Segan building. I won't do that, that's calm. The other thing that we can do with critique, which we don't do very well, but also architects don't do it so well anymore, is every now and again, architects will offer aphorisms about the way they try to work, in all honesty, which is also not that common these days. Um, and there are some people who don't say much. Levin said almost nothing, in fact, so it's very difficult to know what he was doing, so you have to look at the work. But there are some people, like you know, my second favourite architect, Millie Carlo Scarpa, who will send out these funny little comments, like, I'm a man of Byzantium who came to Venice by way of Greece, which is a crazy statement. 
But he's suggesting to you, well, if you want to understand the work, from my end, you have to do that. Okay? And later on, we find the best critics, like Francesco del Coe, etc., attempting to understand that sentence. Attempting to see that in the work. Or if it's not that, what is it? Of course, so they can make a contribution <coughs> back to Carlo Scarpa about Scarpa's work with reference to this statement. So again, you can see, I hope you can see, that I'm leaning on the kind of public placement, the public contribution, even in, word, in terms of text that these people are making, to attempt the critics to engage with the work. People who try to understand the work, Scarpa just offers this to you, this crazy sentence. Yeah? So he's just try and understand the work through that. That's, I think that's how I work. Right? He's also saying, I'm not a great judge because I'm too close to it. So someone else has to do that. So I'll send you something out there and see if you can take it apart. Again, you can see where I'm going with that one. He's actually saying, please don't personalise it. Because I can't escape the personality of it. And I want to. If you want to know what the work is, you can't pretend you're Carlo Scarpa. Because he can't see it properly. Because he's just simply too close to it. If you do anything like me, when you finish your work, all you can see is the bits that didn't work. Because all the bits that did work, you fully expected them to. And you're on to the next project anyway, even if you don't have one. <laughs> yeah? And Scarfer was certainly like that. And he was so fucking slow that he wondered if he was ever going to complete any project, let alone move on to the next one. <coughs> the other thing about critique is you can also look at the documents <laughs> and see what someone does on the way to making the work. But I won't get deflected into a Scarfer lecture. But he does say things like, I want to see, therefore I draw. So when he does a drawing, you have to go, so what's he seeing? Yeah. What is he seeing? And what does that tell me about the work? If he draws, it's not exactly the same room, but it's the same project. If he draws it like that and it ends up looking like that, what's the orange shit? The orange shit is concrete. And Scarpa will tell you later on that I don't lie in my drawings. I don't pretend that the drawing is concrete. So I'm not going to draw it like concrete. So I'll draw it orange, because concrete's not orange. But if it still looks like concrete to me on the drawing, I must be getting somewhere. He's a funny boy, but he does ask you to think rather seriously about, even how do you do a drawing? Stop kidding yourself that if the drawing looks good as a drawing, it might actually equal a good building. He's saying, I can't do that. I don't believe that. Buildings are way too complex to simply think I can draw them and think I've succeeded. <coughs> <clears throat> and if you're lucky enough to visit any of them, particularly the good ones, they are phenomenal. And for me, when Delco writes about it in his fabulously complex, probably overwordy translations, for me, I find myself walking around wishing I wish Francesco Delco was with me, at the very least to have a conversation with him, but at some point to ask him, just can you just clarify that again for me, Francesco? Because I know what you're talking about, but I think you can see it better than I can. <coughs> da -da -da. Da -da -da. Where am I going to go here? Scarpa, Nice, Corb, <coughs> Oh, And a very brilliant student at UWA did a Scarpa critique, and it was superb. Uh, he was in the same category as Chris's. I saw Chris sitting here before. It's Chris at the back, yeah. <coughs> Chris's piece on Scarpa is in the same kind of vein. And Chelsea somehow found that Corb had made a similar statement. Greece by way of Byzantium, the pure creation of the spirit. <coughs> I don't think Corb met Scarpa, did he? Yeah, yeah, do you know? I know that Corb visited Scarpa's work and did say... At some point in Venice, to the people who he was being escorted around with, he was taken to the <coughs> Clarini Stampaglia Gallery, and apparently Le Corbusier asked the people who were taking him around, which artisan did this? <laughs> and if someone like Le Corbusier says, which artisan did this, then <laughs> the author knows that, so he stepped me up a notch from architect to some degree. 
because he's realizing there's stuff going on here that we don't go anywhere near. <coughs> we do other stuff, but this is artisan material. <coughs> That's pretty good accolade for me. <coughs> uh, I'm going too slow, so I'm going to move on to my stuff. But another person who, very briefly, who I think is worth paying attention to, because there are very few architects who can write openly enough to want to engage you. And Rossi is one of them, Elder Rossi. <coughs> Unfortunately, he died way too young. Um, but he's written a book called, the, well, The Architect of the City is brilliant, but the Scientific Autobiography is one of the few architectural autobiographies that I think is an architect quite honestly trying to explain something that he knows he can't explain because he is an architect. He doesn't have any choice in it. Kenneth Clark once said that about Sidney Nolan, that like all geniuses, he had no say in the matter. Nolan had no choice. He just had to wake up every morning and paint. That was just the way it was going to be. <coughs> I think Rossi is the same, and he knows it. So the things he thinks about are architectural, no matter what they are. And in the scientific autobiography, there's some brilliant passages of him saying, these little illuminations of me in the world have opened the door on me clarifying the way I have to think about architecture. <clears throat> but I think the value is that they're always things external to him, and they're never his work. So he can then take them as public contributions and try to fold them back into the work as public contributions. <clears throat> and I think there are very few architects who can actually do that. But Rossi has given us both. He's given us the scientific autobiography with its little aphorisms, and the work, and its explanations of the work. So that, for Rossi, <coughs> this same photo appears in two formats. There's the architectural photo with no kids there. And Rossi says, no, no, you missed the point. My favourite photo is this one, because that's why there's a clock on the wall. That's why it's so pure, so that what you notice is the kids having their photo taken. And all the kids in the photo who had that photo can look at it 50 years later and go, and it was a quarter past two on that day. <coughs> so the full format of that happening is made available by the architecture. It's purity. At some point, it's severity. Certainly for us in Australia, it appears severe. But if any of you have been to northern Italy, you know that most work in northern Italy looks kind of like that anyway. It's just not quite that pure. <coughs> But I love the fact that Rossi's prepared to go, this is the photo that you should see. This is, the, this is why the work was done. Not for the work. The work is done for the kids. And if you read the scientific autobiography, he'll tell you why, in an indirect way, why that's the case. <coughs> There's a lovely one. He says, in some of my recent projects or ideas, or, or ideas for projects even, I try to stop the event just before it occurs. And I must say... I have tried that as well, and I've also realised reflexively, reflectively, that that happens to me when I visit some buildings. When I said to you before, the building appeared to know that I was going to was going to visit it. To me, that's exactly what Rossi's saying, which is why that photo is brilliant. And I hope the photographer took it at the point going just now. She's going to run through the shadow, and that's it. Yeah. Bang! That's what it's for. Only because of the intercolumn, the separation of the big fat columns at Galeratesi, there's a certain time of the day, every day when the sun's out, that that happens. There's one shadow left for a few minutes, and then it's done. <coughs> and I really hope the photographer didn't send the girl through, but he just, he or she just happened to be standing there and went, get ready, it's going to happen, click, yes. Only that building will allow that to happen. <coughs> So then if I moved on to, see what the next image is, yeah. If I move on to me writing critique, I'll, I'll go a bit faster. <coughs> Some of you may have read these articles, but I'll try to explain what I was trying to do. Okay. So this is something that I wrote about the Lions Building, oops, the Lions Building, which I call the Lizard in Swanson Street. And for me, see for me, I know... I went through university with the Lions boys. One of them is exactly my year, and the other three are below me, but I know them all 
and I know them personally. <clears throat> so for me to write an article about the work is, well, I have to be both professional and realise that I'm going to be writing about stuff that I'm going to have lunch with these people. So <laughs> I don't want to shit in their nest too much. <clears throat> so I have to be, and that makes me think, well, I have to be not simply constructive, but my opening comment about the work is trying to do something. So if I think it's flawed, how did the attempt to do something end up flawed? Because I want to make a contribution, at least, to the next thing they do from the way I think. <clears throat> so I've written, difficult enough in any climate, in any building type, but this is it, and the difficult enough was the fact that the building was finished under budget and one full semester ahead of time. And if you've ever worked on any building before, finishing anything on time is a miracle. Finishing a building that complex on a tight urban site a full semester ahead of time is quite incredible. <clears throat> so the professionalism is not at issue. In fact, the professionalism is completely unassailable. They're way in front of most people at all the professional levels. But this is a very complex building on a very tight urban site and the architects have not shied away from any of the tools and rules of architectural composition. So I'm trying to say they've had a go at everything and they haven't backed off from any of it. The plan is complex but not confusing. The form is difficult but not disruptive. The, the spaces are myriad yet accommodatingly seamless. Right? And in me, for me phrasing those things, I'm also saying that's not the way I would do it. But that's not the point here. Because I'm, so I'm trying to say the spaces are myriad, they're, they're really complex. But they're accommodating, accommodatingly seamless in fact. So if you visit the building, you don't get lost. And yet if you look at the plan, it's very, very complex. So these people know what they're doing. <coughs> the building systems are pragmatic but not dogmatic. So they're pragmatic because they look completely reasonable. That'll work. We can make that happen. We don't have to be super inventive. We don't have to pretend we're Carlo Scarpa. We can make it work. But also they're not dogmatic. So they're not ramming it down my throat. This is the way it should be done. So they're kind of open to my consideration, if you like. The finishes are prolific, but their thoughtfulness renders them appropriate. So I'm saying, and they're thoughtful. The thing is crazy. There's so much going on, and yet it's obviously thoughtful. The surfaces are highly studied, yet are encouraging and engaging. And I feel like that. The building wants me to be engaged by it. It encourages me to feel like this is a good space to be. The, surface, uh, the services and technologies are specific, yet architecturally integrated. And I know that the lion said this, despite lion's proclamation to the contrary, I do not find the building willful. As the discipline and integrity of its making embodies evident dedication and integrity. Because I asked them, why is it so all over the place? Why is it so complexly various? And Kerry says, ah, oh, it's kind of willful. We kind of cough up things and then we pursue them and we let them run their course a bit and then we'll adopt them and then we'll take another photo and do something else with it. Yeah? So they say it's willful. I go, it's not willful. It's not willful. You guys are too good to suggest that it's willful. So I'm also saying you have to own up to your own capability a little bit here. Don't go soft on it. And you know why they go soft. They go soft because they think, I'll go soft. <laughs> Oh, it's willful. All right. Well, Des will leave that alone. Fine. And Des goes, nah, yeah, I'm not going to leave it alone because it's not willful. You see what I'm saying? So please, architects, step up to the mark. If you spend all that time making that incredibly complex thing happen, yes, it looks at one point willful, but if you look at it for more than 10 seconds, you go, that's not willful. The number of decisions you have to make to get to that point cannot be described as willful. So what else is going on? <coughs> Yet I am led to inquire, what does all this individuated effort and its myriad spatial, formal and surface identities tell me about my place in the building and therefore, by extension, my place in the social dimension of architecture? 
So I'm trying to say, I don't think the, the flaw in the building is that lions haven't enjoined with what it means to be part of a tertiary in educational institution. And it's not about you and you and you and you and you individually, which I suggest is what that building is about. Right? That's why they think willful is okay. Because Ned is willful and Nick is willful and whatever, whatever. You all have your own ideas. Willfulness, fine. Enjoy. <laughs> Just enjoy it. Yeah? And students do enjoy it, but they enjoy it individually. And I say the problem with the architecture is that the social, socio-political milieu that it is inescapably in is incorrectly addressed. Because public tertiary education by an institution of the kind of weight and scale of RMIT is not about the 50,000 individuals who go there. It's about what does the 50,000 individuals who end up being professionals, what's their responsibility to society outside that? <clears throat> and that's collective. <laughs> yes, it's carried out individually, but the individuation is not what makes it work. This is, and that's my critique. <clears throat> Where have I got to? Have I gone on to the next one? Yeah. Do buildings of this manner encourage and foster a positively intended? Because it is positively intended. Self-identity. You all have a self-identity. Right? And I'm getting this straight from Hannah Arendt, but particularly from Charles Taylor and John Ralston Saul, talking about the nature of individuation in the current world. <clears throat> and they will discuss the socio-political dimension of that. Because I'm an architect, I read it architecturally, I look at the building, Yes, I teach in an educational institute, tertiary educational institution. I've thought about the matter, and I can make commentary, because I'm an architect, about that with regard to it through the architecture. And might this autonomy be in conflict with students and courses being understood and represented, and represented as part of a larger professional body of knowledge and as part of a larger institution of RMIT and tertiary education? In suggesting to us that each space we occupy should be individual and articulate, which they are, are we displaced from a worthy sense of the larger collective? Yes, I'm going soft by writing them as questions, because I'm trying to get the audience to engage with my inquiry, because I'm not going—I don't have enough space, and I'm not going to be dogmatic enough to ram the answer down your throat. <laughs> but I am going to aim in the direction of what I think is the answer. <coughs> We get a fragmentation of processes and, occup and occupancies. So yes, the complexity, see what I'm doing? <laughs> I'm saying I'm sliding towards, it's actually fragmented, and that's a negative charge. <laughs> right? So complex is great, I love complexity. But if it ends up in fragmentation of processes and occupies, mm, that's not such a great thing. We get addition, not collective. We get complexity without contradiction. As it seems, we may have replaced com complexity with the weight of numbers. And yes, I'm pinching it completely from Robert Venturi, because I know that the lions, particularly Corbett, who studied under Venturi, know that stuff backwards. But I'm also suggesting they're not doing themselves the full service, because they know that that's not what Venturi was saying. So we get complexity without contradiction. And it seems we may have replaced complexity with simply the weight of numbers. So it's not actually complex. There's just a lot of stuff going on. Carlos Gaffa, he's complex. Look at Boussier, he is unerringly complex. Right? Mies is very complex. He just looks simple for about three nanoseconds if you're there. And then it just mounts up for you. Because <clears throat> the spaces look like that. And they are amazing. Some of you may have visited it. I visited it before this, I think this is a photo from, yeah, I think this is one of mine. We visited it just before it was occupied. And we were all walking around going, A, how the hell did you make it? And B, imagine if someone scratches or dents or fouls up that ceiling fold. And you send the painter in and go, can you just patch the green? He goes, which fucking green? <laughs> 
So you can see what I'm saying. Someone has spent an enormous amount of time designing that and then realizing we can do that in, in, inside the budget. <coughs> right? So what I'm trying to say is these guys know their stuff. They know it brilliantly. Their competence is not at issue. But I'm not so sure that they're directing all that capability towards what I think the architecture at root cause should be addressing in tertiary education. <coughs> so we get complexity without contradiction, blah, blah. We don't get ambiguity as we are presented with great variety. The work seems to come without hierarchy. Of course, there's things, well, we should have hierarchy. <laughs> of course, I think you can't escape hierarchy unless you're a black fellow. But that's a whole other lecture. <coughs> All these architectural events come at the same level of intention and intensity. And although the level is very high, we seem to have lost the, quote, horizon of significance and seem to suffer, quote, a loss of meaning and hence a trivialization. That's Charles Taylor. That's not me. But that's also me trying to be a good critic to say, at certain points, someone else is going to say what I'm aiming at really clearly. All right? And as a professional, if I can get someone else on my side, I'm going to employ them. <coughs> there is a sense of entering a flattened world in which there aren't very meaningful choices because there aren't any crucial ones. <coughs> it shares some of the qualities of very thoughtful retail architecture, and that seems misplaced here, as this is a public building. Blah, blah, blah. <coughs> So, I don't know if I am doing it, but I am, I'm attempting to be positive in my contribution to critique whilst not going soft on the building or, in fact, the architects, who I know quite well. But I'm trying to point out, I think there are bigger issues that it's, for some reason, not addressing. And I'm also suggesting that with the confidence that they've brought to it, why didn't they address it? Why did they fall back on saying, it's, it's okay, Des, it's willful? No, it's not. You can't draw that plan willfully. You have to go to 25 meetings with a whole lot of numbskulls around the table and try and convince them that you know what you're doing. And it looks like a train wreck. Right? But at this point, they do know what they're doing. They're completely convinced. Right? And we would struggle to understand it. Is that an amoeba pattern or are they discs? I don't know. But I've been into the rooms. And they're great for everybody sitting at the desk. They're all having their own little world. Standing at this end is really difficult because I have spoken to staff who teach there and they go, it's a nightmare because all the students are just wandering off, even in the same room. They're wandering off into their own little individuated pattern. <coughs> I can't line them up. <laughs> I can't see the whites of their eyes and are you understanding me because they're all facing different directions. Which is great if you want to wander off facing different directions, except you're all in the same class. You're all trying to get the same material and you're trying to get it contexted for you. <coughs> and its public urban positioning is fabulous and irrepeatable. Like, they got the site to get the cranked axis of Swanson Street to give it to them right in the neck. Inescapable. So you get the great cafe bar on axis, right? <clears throat> but with that, they said, the portals that address the Carlton axis of Swanson Street provide an exceptional urban vantage point. However, I feel they teeter on the edge of opportunity rather than enlightenment. As this vantage point is pressured by the portal's architectural exuberance. It's, you know, how clever are we? And look where we are. How lucky are we? So I'm suggesting this is teetering on the edge of opportunity rather than concretizing, do you know how special this position is in Swanson Street? Because there's a guy up the road with all the circles who is not playing that game in the least. He's saying everybody who's in this room is in here for this gig and the gig has this kind of stature. Yeah. He's tough in the other direction, Sean Godsall, but for me, I have to say, he's a tough boy, but that building has much more to do with the stature and status of education, particularly at the tertiary level, than this one. 
The dilemma professionally is that Sean's pushed the budget to the absolute limit. And the builders got fried along the way trying to finish it, trying to understand what he was doing, and finishing it to the level that he required. <coughs> and yet here, which looks more difficult, somehow they managed to get that thing over the line under budget for four times. <coughs> so for us architects operating at this time, that's tricky business. Because it's hard to beat this. If you're a client, it's hard to beat this. <coughs> and you go into the lecture theatres, it's just, I don't know, it's like a set from Star Wars. And you can see outside from every lecture theatre. So rather than pretending you're wandering off, you can just wander off, just look out the window. <coughs> and then I said this at the end. Um, and I'm interested in whether Diego's got a comment at this point. Coupled with what appears as a uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm conscious that this push for distinction, because I'm at this point I've gone through the, uh, the responsibilities and the pressures of being an architect and being original, particularly nowadays, being kind of highly personalised, having your own idea, looking like you've got everything under control, blah, blah, blah. I'm conscious that it, this push for distinction, this need for personal authenticity, may be diminishing the larger cultural role of architecture. I recall an almost uniquely insight or insightful review of Gary's Bilbao, where the reviewer was full of praise for the building's design capabilities, yet was concerned that in the end, quote, it had no sense of destiny. Which I read as, it doesn't know what it's doing. Where am I going? Why am I standing here looking like this? Magnificent as it is, what's the point? <coughs> At what point does this highly articulate composition of architectural identities run cult counter to cultural clarity? And I'm putting my cards right on the table, I think. We should be about cultural clarity. And you have to do it with architectural identities because you have nothing else to talk with. Yeah. But I think it was, um, no, his name just went out of my head. The guy who writes for um, the square format, Lotus, um, at the time, who wrote, he felt that it had no sense of destiny. Gary's Bill Bauer. <coughs> he wouldn't even bother with that quote for the subsequent work, I would suggest. Because he would say, I think I was probably right at that point. Because <coughs> now they're Gary buildings. But at that point, they weren't. It was Bilbao, because there was nothing like it before. Does that seem like a reasonable comment, Diego? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But it was very prescient and pretty perceptive of the guy who wrote it at the point to think, wow, this is fabulous, but I'm not sure what it means. Yeah, no sense of, brilliant way to put it. I, I feel it had no sense of destiny. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's probably, can you see how good it is? He's probably not thought about destiny and architecture prior to that point until he gets confronted by a building which is so phenomenally engaging that the idea of destiny appears to him. Wow, I never thought about that before. <coughs> and yet, Just having a building that actually poses that question. Yeah. It's, 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 it's quite profound. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> is that enough? I can ask questions and just put the big title up there, reasonably immune. <coughs> which was going to be the title of the article for the next building, but Architecture Australia wouldn't run that one. <laughs> it was an immunology building, and they thought, what's he talking about? But I was talking about reason, and it's an immunology building. Just that the building is not reasonable. It looks reasonable, but it's actually not. It doesn't use reason. <coughs> looks like that. And again, they're friends of mine. <laughs> I know them. Ron hasn't spoken to me much since, but <coughs> she's happy. Anyway, if you want to ask questions or else I can just babble forever until I die and you can ring my daughter and tell her I'll be late for dinner. <laughs> <coughs>